Hi everybody, welcome this week. We are going to be going over one of my favorite topics, it's persuasion. And we're going to be looking at seeking to persuade. So as we go on, we first want to define the word persuasion. So looking at it, and you can, I'll read along with you, the process of attempting to change or reinforce a listener's attitudes, beliefs, values, or behaviors. Now realize, we already talked about the difference between attitudes, beliefs, and values. So now we're trying to look at how we can change or alter these. Now there is another word that goes along with this idea for some people, the coercion. Now realize, this is using force to get someone to do what you wish, okay? Now, we are told, we're not told this, we know, and using coercion is unethical because it takes away the idea of free will. So coercion is not a form of persuasion, okay? Now, yes, when you're forcing someone to do something, you're getting them to do what you want, but you're not persuading them, because persuading them, you're actually changing their beliefs and different things like that. But, co um, but coercion, you're actually forcing them. So they could be cleaning your floor or doing whatever, but they might not believe they should, or they might not be happy with it or different things like that. An example I would use is picture growing up. When you are, some of you might have this with, if you already have children, but cleaning your room, how many of you actually want to clean your room as a child? Very few people. But if your mom convinces you, well, if you clean your room, then I'm going to give you ice cream or different things like that. That's persuading because you're cleaning your room because you're wanting to due to the reward. But sometimes parents tell you, if you do not clean your room, you're going to be grounded. Okay? Now you're doing it to go against the punishment, but you're forcing them to do it. They're not choosing to do it because they might get ice cream or they want to or different things like that. But instead, you're forcing them. Or you might even say, okay, if you don't clean it within five minutes, you're not getting ice cream. Then it takes away the free will. They can still choose not to, but then they get something that they do not want. Okay? So it's forcing them versus choosing or persuading them, giving them something to make them be like, okay, I'll do it, instead of saying you have to do this. Now, as we go on, we're going to have to find the reason for, to persuade. And when we do that, there's something called the hierarchy of needs. So the hierarchy of needs, this is the idea and the theory that humans have certain levels. And these levels are defined in five levels that have it. And the lower levels have to be hit before we can get to the higher levels. Okay? Now, when we look at the hierarchy of needs, it looks something like a pyramid. So there are five levels that we're going to be looking at. And first is the bottom level. This is physiological needs. The physiological needs, the stuff that you have to, to get by to live, basically. Okay, food and water can fit into this. Some of this, it would be shelter, but shelter normally fits under another one. But food and water, you have to have food and water to live. You do not have to have your cell phone to live. You do not have to have anything else to live. But you have to have food and water. Next level would be safety needs. So we have food and water, now it's safety needs. A home, clothing, different things like that. Does it have to be nice clothing? No, it just has to be basic. Then we go up to social needs. This goes into where we get some designer clothing, some nicer clothing that looks nicer, okay? A cell phone can go into social needs, especially in today's world. Cell phone used to be way up here, but as we're getting more technology advanced, it comes up here. I taught in China this summer, um, I taught in China this past summer, and when I did that, it was with safety needs with a phone, because you basically have to have a phone to get around. Everything you pay is with your phone. I did pay with cash every now and then, but once I got hooked up on my phone, it was a lot easier. I was in Shanghai, and in Shanghai, if you actually hail a taxi, unless it's a game day, if you hail a taxi, you can actually be arrested. You have to do it all from your phone, okay? So that goes to safety. You basically have to have a phone to get around Shanghai, but you have to do it to live. No. Okay, but in America, most places, food and water is the bottom, and then it's a house, clothing, different things like that, and then a phone, and some maybe nicer clothing. And it's self esteem needs. This could be getting nicer and nicer clothing, or that nice phone case, you're getting uh, a newer phone, or different things like that. Whereas the top level is self actualization needs. This is those people who stand in line for the brand new iPhone X, it's coming out you know, the next day, and people who stand in line for the new iPhone. And they just got the brand new iPhone last year, and their phone works just fine, so they want to do it. This is here. Because the phone is really in social needs, or one of these. But then the brand new phone is up here because they want to have top of the line stuff. These are people who drive a Ferrari or different things like that, right? They could drive a regular car to get them around. But they are up here because they have all of these met, 
with the item of transportation, so now they want to get up here. Now really, some people are up here in certain areas, but down here in some areas, because they might not care as much. Some people really want the newest technology, so they're going to be up here. But they don't care as much about a car, so their car is going to be down here. But as long as they have the newest phone, they're up here. Okay, so it could be in different areas depending on what product is or what style of product you're looking for. And then we always know those people who you know live up here the whole time. But what this theory states is before you can get someone to buy a, the brand new iPhone, you have to make sure they actually have another phone. Or before someone can get a brand new car, you want to make sure that they have basic food and water. Because what it's saying with this is if they don't have food and water, they're not going to be able to buy this, or they're not going to want this product, because they're more so looking at this. Again, we always know those people who barely can feed their children and do all of that, but yet they're buying the brand new stuff. Okay, they are the people who don't really fit in the theory, but, feel, uh, but thinking about it, they really should have the basic needs met before they get up here. And that's what the hierarchy of need is. Now, as we move forward, we want to make sure that we're establishing credibility with uh, pathos, which is the emotional appeal. So you're looking at it and you're saying, oh, look, I really want to do that because it makes my heart happy or something like that. So you're being persuaded to do something due to emotional appeal. You could also do logos, and logos would be something like, oh, I really want to do that because it makes sense. An example that I use with these is, with, um, sorry, with these, I really have been wanting new ski boots. I own my own skis, and the way I did it was through logos. But with the new skis, I tell my wife, she's a very mathematical person, okay, I tell her, look, here's how much new skis would cost. Here's how much I pay for my ski boots, not skis. Here's how much these ski boots will cost. Here's how much is how I pay for them when I rent them. This is how often we go. And I showed her the math and said, after X amount of years, they're going to be paid off and then we're going to be saving money. Okay, so that's logic. It logically makes sense that I should do that. It's going to save money. But if my wife was more like me, I would say, just think, getting new ski boots would be so good. I, they could be my own color. I could get what I want. I don't have to walk to the ski ski store and try them on and then walk all the way back to the cabin and then have my ski boots have to walk there. I just put all my ski boots in the cabin, you know, and if the cabin's close, then we put the ski boots on, walk out, and go on the slope. You know, wouldn't that be great? And that's the one I tried to use this year, but then what happened is the cabin we were in was a half a mile away, so it didn't really work. Okay, so it's pathos, logos, and ethos. Okay, now ethos, I know it says pathos right here, so let's say ethos. Now ethos is the ethical appeal. Okay? We all have that one friend who we do everything with. And if they tell us, hey, you should jump off this bridge, you're going to look at them and say, oh, no, I don't think that's smart. And some people will say, I don't think that's smart. Some people will be like, okay. But then <clears throat> what happens is that friend's going to look at you and say, have I ever steered you wrong before? And you're going to be like, no, you haven't. Let's jump off this bridge. And you do it. Okay? But some people, it takes a little bit of persuasion to say, look at my track record. Look at the ethics of our friendship. Look at me as a person. Don't you trust me? Yes, I do. This is why when you have testimonials from certain celebrities, you're like, I love that celebrity. I'm going to do it. Their ethics, their background is good. But then sometimes when certain celebrities are the spokesperson for certain products, you're like, nope, not doing that because their ethics are all out of whack. And a lot of times, the uh, example is Jared from Subway, when they figure out he was doing all the having all those issues and doing the things that he shouldn't have been doing, then what happened was Subway took him out because now people don't want to follow Jared and they don't like him and his weight loss story and all that due to the unethical things he was doing. Now as we move forward, there are three common terms that are going to be going over. Now I realize the text does not talk about this, but these are three of my favorite persuasion terms because again, this is one of my favorite subjects. So looking at it first is mere exposure theory. Okay, mere exposure theory is the theory that you were going to have something that you might not like. So we all have that have heard a song that we do not enjoy, correct? The first time we hear it, we're like, oh, that's not a good song. Then we hear it again, oh, why is that song still playing? Then we hear it again, okay, I kind of see the interest in the song, we play it again. Okay, I kind of like the song, play it again. Oh my gosh, this is the best song ever. Okay, so that's what mere exposure theory is. And the more and more we're exposed to something, the more and more we're going to like it. The issue is, with mere exposure theory, if you hear it too much, you see it too much, different things like that, you're all of a sudden going to start hating it. 
Okay, so mere exposure theory is the more and more you listen to it, the better it's going to be. But all of a sudden, you hear too much, it goes downhill fast. So you have to make sure you have that good balance of not doing it too much or it's going to go downhill. An example would be the Sonic commercials. Have you seen the Sonic commercials or the Progressive with Flo? The two guys on the Sonic or Flo off the Progressive, they've been around so long and they do it so much that at first you might have been like, oh, they're kind of stupid or this is stupid. Oh, no, I kind of see the humor in it. All of a sudden you're like, oh my gosh, Flo again or oh my gosh, the Sonic people again. Where some people still like them, but the more and more you see them, you're like, I get it. Move on. Then bandwagon. Everyone's heard of jumping on the bandwagon, but bandwagon fallacy is talking about how if an item becomes more successful, more and more people will jump on it, and then the more and more success it has, the more people will follow it. But the issue with bandwagon is you make one mistake, everyone jumps off the bandwagon. The example I use for this is picture that you have a football team, a hockey team, a baseball team that you're following. You are a true fan. All of a sudden, your team is going to playoffs, going to the Super Bowl doing whatever, and then all of a sudden they're, they lose, or when they're making it, everyone's like, yeah, all of a sudden everyone's that fan, and you're like, where were all of you when we were losing last season? Okay, now everyone's that fan, and then they lose once, and they're like, oh yeah, I was not that team fan, I did not like that team, okay? They jumped off the bandwagon. So what makes bandwagon so successful is the more success you have, the more and more people follow you. But you make one mistake, and it, everyone just falls off. So bandwagon is easy to get people to follow you, but it's also one slip up, everyone falls off. Now pain pleasure principle is one of my favorites. If it is used correctly, then it is going to be able to be super, super successful. But the issue is most people can't use it correctly. So what this is saying is you have to have the perfect balance between pain and pleasure. You should show them the pain of the product, but also show them the pleasure of using it. An example would be the um, ASPCA dog commercials. Now they do not do this that well because they only show you the pain. So when you hear the in the arms of an angel, when you hear that commercial come on, what's going to happen is you're going to look at it. A lot of people turn the TV off, change the channel, mute it, do whatever. Okay. And the reason is because they have too much pain and not enough pleasure. So with this, if they're able to show us the sad dog commercials and then all of a sudden halfway through change the song up, make it a happier song, and then show these dogs and cats being adopted and playing with their new owners and all of this, then what's going to happen is saying, oh, look at all these sad dogs. But look, I can be one of those owners and I can actually do something. Whereas right now, they're just trying to say, oh, look at this, the emotional feel of sadness, sadness. But realize, when you're using pathos with, <coughs> when you're using pathos with the emotional appeal, you need to say, pathos, pathos, Sadness, sadness, happiness. You have to have a good mixture. A commercial that does this really well is St. Jude. Because they have the cute little kids who might not have uh, hair or they're in a wheelchair or something like that. And they're saying, I have leukemia. Because we're all like, oh my gosh, this little five-year-old kid has leukemia. How sad. And then they say, but with St. Jude, I was able to recover and do all of this. So at the same time, they're saying, oh, how sad, this cute little kid has leukemia, but they're so cute, and they have leukemia, but now they're happy. And that was because St. Jude. St. Jude is actually known as one of the best track records when their commercials come on. A lot of people start donating. Whereas the ASPCA, they actually don't get a lot of people to donate with their commercial. Now, these are the three main common terms. Realize, they are e different ways of getting people on and getting people off. So mere exposure theory, again, the more and more you listen to it, the more and more people are going to like it. But once you hit that point of too much, people are going to fall off and they're not going to like it as much. They like it, the more success you are, the more people follow you, you mess up once, everyone can easily fall off. Okay, and then pain-pleasure principle, it's very hard to do, but if you can find the perfect mixture between pain and pleasure, happiness and sadness, then it's going to be very successful. But if you have too much happiness, then people are going to be like, oh, Looks like they're doing fine. I don't need to donate. They have enough. But if you have too much sadness, people are going to be like, oh, I can't see that. I don't want to watch that. Okay, and they're not going to hear your message. Now, as we move on, there's the one last thing that we're going to talk about is social judgment theory. And this is the way that people judge and look at something about a message. So there are three different aspects of it. So a lot of acceptance, meaning that they accept this. They're looking at it and they say, okay, yeah, I believe that. I accept it, okay? They might already, already think it, and then the rejection, no, I disagree with that, I reject it. And then the non-commitment, I really don't care. 
Now, which one's the hardest, you think? Okay, you said rejection. You are actually incorrect. Rejection is the second easiest or second hardest. So the last thing that acceptance is easy. You're like, hey, you should come over here. And then you're like, oh, yeah, whatever you're doing, I like. Let's go. Okay? But the latitude of rejection, people are going to be like, nope, I, don't, I don't, don't agree with you. But a lot of times rejection, they'll at least sit with you and talk about why they think you're wrong or why they're right, and they'll have a discussion or a debate with you. Whereas latitude is non-commitment, they're going to say, no, I don't care. Good night. Okay? So, but the latitude of rejection, there's always those people who are so stubborn that are on the list of you. They're going to say, no, I'm right this way. And then you say, no, 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 no. Hey, la, 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 la. Okay? We don't want to do that when you don't want to be that person in latitude of rejection. And those people, you should just really give up on because they're not going to listen to you or find another way to persuade. Now, looking at this, the let's go back to a political debate with Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. Okay? Or any debate between a Republican or a Democrat. Normally what happens is you have people who say, yes, I'm voting along with you. Or, no, I disagree with you. But those people who disagree with you, you're going to say, I'm voting for this person. Why? Why are you voting? They did this, this, this. The person I'm voting for does this, this, this. They're discussing with you. And they're going to now hopefully see more of your side and slowly maybe come over. Or they might say, okay, I can see where you're coming from. I still disagree, but I understand it more. Whereas these people, they say, I don't talk politics, fine, I believe. And they're just going to leave. They're not even going to listen because they don't care. Okay? Now, in your speech, this goes along with the Monroe's motivational sequence. Monroe also did the hierarchy of needs. There are five different things that you need in a persuasive speech. And this is the best sequence that you need to have. So first, you need to get their attention. Like, hey, everyone, here's the issue we're having. Like, here's what I'm saying. So your thesis is within the intention. Attention is a lot of times your, within your introduction. And then here's the need. This is what we're needing from you. This is what we're getting you to do. Okay, so attention is, hey, over here, here's the need, or here's what we're going to talk about. Now, here's the need. Let me tell you a little bit more about it. And the satisfaction, this is what you'll, if you do this, this is why you should do it. It'll make you feel good. It will uh, help you. It will save money in your bank, or it will make your skin look prettier, or you'll be faster or whatever, okay? And then, can't you picture yourself in that brand new car? Visualization is number four. So I can picture yourself in that car, can you? Just think about it. Picture yourself in that car, yes, that looks great. And then action, now buy the car, okay? So first step is attention. Second step is need. Third is satisfaction. Fourth is visualization. Fifth is action. You need to have all five steps to have the, the correct sequence. And this sequence is what you're going to need to do in your persuasive speech. Again, attention. Hey, we have this new car. You can buy this new car. You need this new car. It's about this much money. Doesn't this car make you feel good? Now, when you sit this car, you can picture yourself driving it and picking up all the hot bags, right? So why don't you buy it? Okay? Apple does this so, so well. And if you want to look at something good, it's called the golden circle. And Apple does it well, and it goes along with this idea. Now, that's all for seeking to persuade. If you have any questions, you can let me know. Just make sure you follow these ideas. Make sure you remember these buzzwords, such as logos, pathos, ethos, which hopefully you're also using in English classes and other things like that. But also remember the bandwagon fallacy, mere exposure theory, and the pain pleasure principle. There's a lot of things we discuss. This is one of my favorite topics. We only barely touch the surface. And if you ever want to discuss more, have any more questions, I'm all about teaching more in persuasion. I just don't want to overload you. Like every week, if you have any questions, let me know, and I will be more than happy to answer them. But other than that, I hope you have a great week. Bye, guys. And...